Welcome to all of our viewers and listeners today. This is the Road to Wellness webinar, and today we are excited to have a discussion about IgA vasculitis, also known as immunoglobulin A vasculitis. I'm Kathy Olewski, and I'm the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's Road to Wellness webinar series. I'm a patient living with MPA vasculitis. I was diagnosed at age 50 and I was in treatment for six years and I've been in long-term remission off treatment for eight years. And today I would like to introduce two, two of our guests. We're so lucky to have them with us today. We have Dr. Kenana Yashin. Dr. Yashin was awarded the 2020 Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium Vasculitis Foundation Fellowship. She is currently a junior faculty member in the Department of Rheumatic and Immunologic Diseases at Cleveland Clinic. Her interests involve all forms of vasculitis, especially small vessel vasculitis, including GPA, MPA, EGPA, and IGA, cutaneous vasculitis, and drug-induced vasculitis. So welcome, Dr. Yashin. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Kathy. And also, I'd like to introduce Carrie Halula. Carrie is a 58-year-old patient living with IgA vasculitis. She was diagnosed in October of 2020. She's currently in remission with active monitoring of her kidney function. In her work life, Carrie is the Strategic Account Manager for Material Sciences Corporation. She enjoys, in her spare time, golfing, boating, fishing, and she's married with two children. She has lived in France and China, and she now lives in Ohio with her husband, Tom. So welcome, Carrie. We appreciate you being here, too. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And I think if it's okay, we're just going to jump right in and let Dr. Yashin share her screen so that she can give us a little bit of information on IgA to help us start the seminar today. Um, That's great. Okay, thank you, Kathy, for your nice introduction and um, for hosting today's webinar. And I would love to thank um, Vasculitis Foundation for inviting us today. Um, our topic today is about special form of vasculitis called IgA vasculitis. And before I start my presentation, I would love to um, just highlight that I have no conflict of interest. And most of the photographs I have today in my talk is um, are related to actual patients and we obtain verbal consent from them. And then lastly, most of the treatment that I'm going to discuss today are off-label used um, to treat IgA vasculitis. So our objectives today are, um, we're gonna have a brief introduction about vasculitis and then we're gonna define um, clinical presentation of IgA vasculitis. How do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? And then we're gonna identify the differences in IgA vasculitis between adults and children. And then at the end, we will summarize and we will have questions and answers. So what is vasculitis? Um, vasculitis is a um, general pathological term, means um, inflammation, swelling, and irritation of the blood vessel wall. And this inflammation will lead to um, vessel wall thickening. Um, leading to stenosis and organ ischemia, or to weakening of the vessel wall causing aneurysm formation and with increased risk for rupture and hemorrhage. Vessels are divided into arteries in, in red and veins in blue, and we have large vessels um, which include the aorta and the major branches to the extremities and to the brain. And then the large vessels will be divided into medium vessels inside our internal organs, such as kidneys, liver, and intestine. And then medium vessels will be divided further in smaller branches called capillaries. And these, they do require microscopic examination. So in 2012, um, Chapel Hill Consensus Conference, vasculitis were defined based on the cause of the vasculitis of type of inflammation, um, and most importantly, the size of the affected blood vessels. And based on that, vasculit systemic vasculitis were grouped to three different groups, large vessel vasculitis, which include giant cell arteritis, and this is the most common form of systemic vasculitis in elderly and senior patients. And then we have Takayasu arteritis in young female. Then we have medium vessel vasculitis, which includes polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki disease in children. And then lastly, we have a small vessel vasculitis which is divided into two different categories. First one is called NCA vasculitis, include microscopic with polyangitis, 
EGPA and granulomatosis with polyangiitis. And then lastly, we have immune complex small vessel vasculitis. And this is where we where where IgA vasculitis was included. So what is IgA vasculitis? Um, it's a small vessel vasculitis, obviously, formerly known as Hinochal 9 purpura or HSP for many years. It is considered the most common systemic vasculitis in childhood. However, it's less common in adults. Um, the median age at the onset is six years in childhood and 50 years in adult. And disease is more common in male comparing to female in adult and children and is more common in white and Caucasian comparing to African-American. Disease follows seasonal pattern where um, we have more cases during the fall, winter, and spring. And this is very true in children. Um, and it could be possibly related to high infection rate during these seasons. Um, is not contagious, um, so does not get transmitted from one person to another one. And maybe there is possible genetic predisposition in special population. The first case was described in 1802 by Dr. Hepperden in a four-year-old boy with skin rash, kidney, and gastrointestinal manifestations. And then in 1837, Dr. Schoenlein, he recognized the association of the skin rash with the joint pain. And then we have Dr. Hip, um, he, no, he in 1874, he added the presence of gastrointestinal symptoms and renal involvement. And that's why the disease was called for was called with um, Hinochula and purpura for many, many years. So what is IgA? We have four different um, protein in our, um, in our body called immunoglobulins or antibodies and IgA um, is one of them. They are part of our immune system. IgA antibodies mainly present in our mucosal secretions, in our nose, in our throat, in our stomach, and small intestine. And it's it is considered the first line, the first, the first line defense in our immune system against bacteria, viruses, and foreign pathogens. The exact pathogenesis of IgA vasculitis is unknown, but I but reportedly combination of genetic predisposition in addition to environmental factors such as um, infection or drugs may trigger the immune system, certain cells called B cell. And this is will lead to overactivation of abnormal IgA antibodies and then lead to formation of large molecules. And then this molecule will accumulate in the vessel wall, um, causing overactivation of the immune system again, producing different chemicals. And this is will lead to inflammation of the vessel wall, um, causing damage and leakage of the blood outside. And that's why the name was changed in 2012 to IgA vasculitis, just to reflect the pathogenesis. And what do we see on the biopsy when, when, in IgA vasculitis patients? So IgA vasculitis can be triggered by infections, medications, um, possibly vaccination, and is associated with, drug, with malignancy and other autoimmune diseases as well. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, disease um, follows seasonal pattern where we have more cases during the fall, winter, and spring due to high infection rate, possibly. Most common infections are upper respiratory tract infection, including um, streptococcal, pharyngitis, gastrointestinal infection, hepatitis. And this is reported in 41% of cases in children versus 20% in adults. Um, many drugs can trigger IgA vasculitis, including different antibiotics, such as chlorithromycin, anti-inflammatory medications, such as ibuprofen, and certain medication that we do use to treat our patient with certain immune uh, autoimmune disorders called um, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. And this is reported maybe to up to 15% of cases. Um, can be associated with malignancy as well, and this is up to 10% of cases, mainly in adults. And the most common malignancies are lung cancer, prostate, kidney problem. And usually um, we discover the malignancy a few months after the vasculitis onset. Um, IgA vasculitis is also reported in association with other autoimmune disorders, such as familial Mediterranean fever, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and certain other type of vasculitis called Pechette disease. Now, there are a few reports about vaccinations such as influenza vaccine, MMR, and recently post-corona-19 post vaccine triggering IgA vasculitis as well. 
So how do they present? Um, skin rash is a presenting sign in almost 80% of cases. And the, the classic rash in IgA vasculite is called purpura. And usually it's non-blanchable. It means like when we are pressing on the skin rash, it does not fade away. Usually it's raised above the skin. It looks like bruises, is non-itchy, non-painful, can be burning a little bit. However, in adults, maybe they might present a little bit different. They might have necrotic lesion, they might form blistering, and they might have hemorrhagic lesions as well. Um, primarily, the rash will be located in the lower extremities, and this is very true in children. However, in adults, it can be anywhere on the hand, on the face, on the, uh, uh, on the chest and the abdomen. And usually skin rash is a little bit difficult to treat in adults comparing to children. Different conditions may cause skin rash just looking similar to IgA vasculitis, such as viral infection, drug eruption, vitamin deficiency, other kind of vasculitis disease and bleeding disorder. And that's why skin biopsy is often needed um, to confirm the diagnosis of vasculitis and IgA vasculitis. The first, um, the first photo on the left represent the classic purpuric rash on the legs, as we see here in patients with IgA, with biopsy proven IgA vasculitis. On the other side, we see like um, a typical location on the hands, and we see a typical appearance that the lesion they did ulcerate here. And again, this is biopsy proven IgA vasculitis. The second manifest manifestation is joint pain or arthralgia, and this is present in almost like 80% um, of cases in children and in adults, and usually associated either with soft tissue swelling or um, joint swelling as well. Usually does not cause any permanent damage, and it does last like for a few days, for a few weeks. And some patients, they may report just like diffuse muscle aches without having significant elevation of muscle markers. Um, differential diagnosis, again, include viral infection and other autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis and others. The third manifestation, gastrointestinal manifestation, and this is a present in more than half of the cases in patients, um, in children and in adults, and usually symptoms are divided into mild symptoms, such as abdominal pain and vomiting, and into severe manifestations such as gastrointestinal bleeding, as you can see in this photo, um, this is what's captured um, during colonoscopy in one patient with IgA vasculitis. It may lead to necrosis and bowel perforation, and one serious complication called intussusception, and this is very well known serious complication of IgA vasculitis, more reported in childhood comparing to adults, and in up to 13% of cases, and usually patients they will present with severe abdominal pain, vomiting, and bowel obstruction. This is considered one of the emergency in IgA vasculitis. Most importantly is renal involvement, and this is more, 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 um, more recorded in adults. Um, usually patients, they will have no symptoms at all, and the ur urine continues to be normal, completely yellow looking, and um, however, they may present with new onset hypertension or like they will notice some like soft tissue uh, swelling. Um, oftentimes when we, when we are thinking about IgA vasculitis, we need to screen, we need to do a routine urine analysis, just like to look for protein and hemoglobin. And um, rarely renal failure is recorded in children in less than 1% of cases, whereas 30% of cases in adults, they may present with renal failure. Lastly, um, IgA vasculitis may, may cause bleeding or hemorrhage in the lungs, and this is more reported in adults. And they will have hemoptysis, coughing of blood, or they will come with shortness of breath. When we are doing chest, a chest radiograph, we will see white shadow on the, on the CAT scan or the chest X-ray. Um, may cause heart inflammation as well and causing cardiac arrhythmia. This is very rare. Also may cause eye inflammation or like seizure. And in 30% in of cases may cause like scrotum um, swelling. This is more reported in children comparing to adults. So these clinical manifestations may, may develop over the course of days or weeks, and they may vary in frequency and order of presentation. However, in general, the skin rash will present first in 80% of cases in association with the joint pain and maybe gastrointestinal symptoms, and then later on, we, we may have um, kidney involvement. However, we may have just like isolated skin involvement 
or renal involvement, and we might have just like systemic disease. Of course, clinical presentation, disease course, and outcomes differ between children and adults. And this table summarizes the difference between adults and children. As I said, this is considered the most common form of systemic vasculitis in children. However, it's rare in adults. Um, fall is seasonal pattern in children where it's more common during winter and fall. It's less seasonal in adults, um, mainly triggered by infection in children. However, it's mainly triggered by drugs and associated with malignancy in adults. Um, skin manifestation usually um, located in the lower extremities and very mild in children. However, in adults, it could be severe. It could be also anywhere um, on the upper extremities and the face. Joint manifestation and gastrointestinal manifestation are common in both in children and in adult. However, intussusception is more common in children. Uh, most importantly, the difference in term of renal disease, this is very, this is common in adults. However, it's rare in children um, and usually frequent relapses um, reported in adults comparing to children. This figure, um, so how do we make a diagnosis? Of course, we have to see the patient, we have to examine the skin, we have to look at the joints, examine it, examine the abdomen, and then we will order some blood tests. So we may order complete blood counts. This is, may show elevation of the white blood counts or what we call it leukocytosis. This is maybe, might be related to um, the vasculitis itself or preceding infection. We may order um, check inflammation, inflammatory markers called C-reactive protein, um, sedimentation rate. And again, they might be elevated related to the vasculitis or if there's any infection or malignancy. Um, we will need a baseline urine analysis. And sometimes we just like, we get repeated every three months, every one month. Um, and this is um, may, may, may detect protein or hemoglobin and may indicate early kidney involvement. We will check a kidney function. And lastly, we will check serum um, IgA level, um, which might be elevated in almost 50% of cases. However, this is not specific or, or sensitive to IgA vasculitis. If we have a skin, if we have skin rash, we will we will recommend biopsy. If someone is complaining about abdominal pain or they are having some bleeding, we might refer them to gastrointestinal doctors, just like to um, maybe maybe do upper endoscopy, colonoscopy. And um, if there is any abnormal kidney function or abnormal urine analysis, we may recommend kidney biopsy. This is, so, so skin biopsy uh, um, is required first to confirm the diagnosis of vasculitis, right? To identify what kind of skin rash this, we are, this patient is having. And then secondly, to um, confirm the diagnosis of IgA vasculitis. So what do we see on the skin biopsy? We will see evidence of um, vessel wall destruction, okay? So we will see inflammatory cells infiltrate in the vessel wall. Um, something called fibrinoid necrosis. This is means like destruction of the vessel wall, and we might see extravasation of the red blood cells outside of the vessels. This is this is called leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but it's a general term. It means just there is some vasculitis in the blood vessels, so we need a, we need an additional technique called di direct immunofluorescence. This is to detect IgA um, deposits in the vessel. If we have isolated kidney involvement without any skin rash, or let's say the skin biopsy failed to confirm the diagnosis and we have abnormal kidney function or abnormal urine analysis, we may recommend kidney biopsy in order to confirm the diagnosis. This figure shows the how do we approach patient with confirmed IgA vasculitis. Before I talk about it, we have to address, we, I would like to highlight a few important points here. First of all, we have to identify if there is any trigger. If there is any infection, we have to treat it. If there is any offending drug, we have to remove it. Usually I look for cancer in someone 60 and older, just like making sure it's not, there's nothing really driving the IgA vasculitis. In most of the cases, disease is self-limited, does not require any treatment. And lastly, there is no evidence-based optimal treatment. And this is very true in adults, okay? 
Once we confirm the diagnosis of IgA vasculitis, we, we divide the presentation into non-severe vasculitis and we, di we divide it to severe vasculitis. Non-severe vasculitis means like skin lesion, arthralgia, mild gastrointestinal symptoms. And we treat based on the symptoms, right? So we choose medication. We might choose, like we might say, try acid aminophil, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, even though we should avoid them if, there are, if there's any abnormal kidney function or like concern about kidney involvement or if there is any concern about gastrointestinal bleeding. We may recommend glucocorticoids, steroid or prednisone. And then if we failed glucocorticoids, we might recommend adding one of these medication to control the skin rash, such as dapsone, hydroxychloroquine, colchicine, azathioprine, and methotrexate. Severe vasculitis includes re renal failure, gastrointestinal bleeding, severe skin manifestations, and we might admit the patient just because sometimes they would require like intravenous glucocorticoid, they might require blood transfusion, further assessment, um, immediate workup for them if we're having abnormal kidney function. And we may, we may add like glucocorticoids in addition to um, other immunosuppressive medica medications such as cyclophosphamide, rituximab, or mycophenolate morphetil. So as I said, in more, it's, it's very good outcome in pediatric population. Um, however, a little bit less favorable in adults. Um, chronic kidney disease, they might, it's more common in adults and renal failure as well, comparing to children. Relapses also are more common in adults comparing to children and where we have more skin, gastrointestinal and arthritis and mortality rate is up to 3% of cases. So to summarize, it's the most common systemic vasculitis in childhood. It's rare in adults. However, we don't understand it very well in adults. I don't know why. IgA vasculitis might be triggered by drugs, infections, and malignancy. We have four cardinal um, involved organs, our skin, kidney, joint, and gastro gastrointestinal tract. Skin and or kidney biopsies are required for diagnosis. Disease is self-limited, does not require treatment in most of the cases. There is no evidence-based optimal treatment. In most of the cases, it's very good prognosis in pediatric population. However, renal failure and chronic kidney disease are more common in adults comparing to children. And we and, and um, future research, of course, are required in, in order to understand the many aspects of IgA vasculitis, and we have a few ongoing studies looking at rituximab to treat um, kidney disease and looking at colchicine in treating skin disease as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Yashin. I feel like I almost understand IgA vasculitis now. Uh, I, I think at this point, if it's okay, we'll let um, Carrie talk a little bit. We're going to talk about her, let her share her story about being diagnosed with IgA vasculitis. And um, also she may have some questions for you in the end, if that's okay. Sure. All right, Sherry, I think um, Dr. Yushin, you want to stop sharing or then we can see Carrie. That would be great. Sure. All right. And Carrie, if you are unmuted, we would love for you to just share a little bit about how this came about for you. Yes, for sure. Um, well, I was um, diagnosed, this all started back about um, October of 2020. Um, I happened to be working from home that day. Um, that was the start of where our COVID restrictions were coming through. And so I noticed that I had um, that morning um, a lot of stiffness and swelling in my ankles and my hands seemed to be kind of tight. And um, as the day progressed, um, the rash started um, on my feet, on the top of my feet. And then at least seemed like every 20 minutes that it started just crawling and it was started coming up my legs um, onto my arms, but then it came up through about half of my torso and then it stopped. It never went any further from that. Um, at first I thought maybe I had eaten something, maybe I just had an allergic reaction, um, but the swelling was very odd because I never had anything um, with swelling or stiffness before. Um, so I had called my local physician and that's right when the COVID was kind of rearing its head. So they thought perhaps maybe it was COVID related. So 
they wanted me to test that day before I came into the office. And that's when we had like a three day waiting period. So I went and I tested and then I just stayed home. I wasn't allowed to come back to work in case I had COVID. Um, so I went through my three days of waiting. Well, during that period, um, I started having some severe stomach cramping and started with the vomiting and it was getting more severe and more severe. So I had called my local doctor and she um, said to take, take me to the ER. So once I got to the ER, things were kind of being tested quickly and they realized that um, I was having obviously some kidney function issues. And that's when um, they directed that I'd be taken directly to Cleveland Clinic that evening. So I arrived at Cleveland and um, upon um, uh, coming there, you know, they started the blood testing and various other tests. And um, it ended up, um, I did have a um, skin biopsy as well as the kidney biopsy, which finally um, did confirm that it was the IgA, which I was diagnosed with. And then from there, um, sent home with some medications and everything. And then I followed up um, and ended up in the care of Dr. Yashin, thank goodness. And um, so um, we started working on a plan of attack. And um, so we did treat with some steroid treatments um, for quite a while. Um, and so we worked through kind of weaning off of those for several months. And um, so we, we were doing well. And then about, um, I would say about 10 months later, it was the summer after, then um, lo and behold, I woke up again, had the stiffness and the swelling and the rash came back. So um, back up to Cleveland and <laughs> we talked again and uh, we changed up some medications and so forth and uh, kind of did a little bit of different regimen uh, based on Dr. Yashin's recommendations. And um, after that, you know, we, we finally got off of the steroids, which she knows I love so much. <laughs> and um, I um, we're on hydroxychloroquine right now with a few other blood pressure medications and I'm stable and we're monitoring the blood work and um, the urine for the kidney function. And um, so at this point, the IgA is pretty uneventful since that time. Well, gosh, that's quite a story. Um, before I ask you some questions, Dr. Yashin, do you have anything you want to comment? For Carrie? Yeah, so, so, I mean, I remember the first time when I met with her, like in the office, um, I went to show her skin rash. Um, I do have a photo of that. Let me just share it here. This is how she presented the first time, um, kind of typical rash for what we call it, leukocytoclastic vasculitis or cutaneous vasculitis. Um, we did the skin biopsy, it wasn't, it was inconclusive. It didn't reveal the diagnosis. And then even though like we are, we're highly thinking about it. So we gave her, we prescribed some steroid. And then I remember she called me on the weekend saying, hey, I'm having vomiting, severe abdominal pain. We sent her right away to the emergency department. She got admitted, her kidney function, they were up. So we were concerned about kidney involvement at that time and gastrointestinal involvement. Um, she got a CAT scan. It did show possible inflammation in her small intestine. And then we ended up doing kidney biopsy, which did confirm the diagnosis of IgA vasculitis at the end. Um, of course, after that, we had to put her on, as she mentioned, on um, long course of glucocorticoids or steroid. It did take like almost eight to 10 months to become off. Um, during that time, we discussed about adding another agent. At that time, we didn't add. We just, we, we select, we, we elected to just to go with the glucocorticoids. And then she had another relapse and we noted that, um, the protein in her urine analysis was was trending up, so we selected we elected to add mycophenolate mofetil. She did fine; everything did improve, and no recurrence of the skin rash. And then um, 
because of the COVID, of the coronavirus and the pandemic and the concern about infection, we just, we decided to discontinue mycophenolate and then she had minor flare of her skin rare. So we decided just to add um, hydroxychloroquine. And since then, um, no recurrence of the skin rash, kidney function normal, even protein in the urine has been trend, has been improving as well. Well, that sounds like great news for you, Carrie. I'm, I'm glad you got such uh, great treatment from Dr. Yashin so that you're under control. I did want to ask you, Carrie, what, what have been some of the biggest challenges for you in dealing with IgA? Um, well, I have to say it's um, most probably the joint pain because prior to this and COVID as well, um, we were very active people. And um, so that's really slowed me down quite a bit. Um, the other thing that um, uh, was a result of from the high doses of prednisone is I went through a period of time for about three months of severe hair loss, which was very scary. Um, so that was um, just something I didn't expect. And uh, but the, I would say the joint and swelling pain um, was a thing that affected me personally from doing the things that I normally would do. I have heard that from many vasculitis patients. Mm -hmm. how, how did the disease change your life like impact on your family and your career? Some people say that it just kind of totally derailed work and family things. How did oh. that well, I'm very blessed that I work for a wonderful company um, because they allowed me to actually transition to work from home for almost a total of a half a year for six months. I had some wonderful colleagues that supported me, but um, for, for what I do, um, it was kind of difficult not being in the office, having the direct contact because we couldn't visit customers, but then COVID was going on anyway. But um, the, just the... And I think the isolation of it all, because, um, you know, I wasn't able to return to work because of the immunity, the immunity issue and then COVID on top of that. So I couldn't get back to work till I was able to get all of my vaccines because they have an immune issue. So that kept me kind of on the sidelines a little longer. And I have to say, you know, but everyone was going through a little isolation, but um, that, you know, um, along with, you know, just not, if we were, my husband and I were doing personal training and really getting fit and moving towards some goals that we had. And so all of that, you know, due to the, the joint pain and swelling and everything just all got sidelined. So that really was kind of a, a tough thing to handle at that time. It sounds like it. Um, I know that we talked a little bit, or Dr. Yashin talked a little bit, and you did about you've experienced some remission and relapse. And can you talk a little bit about that experience, how you dealt with either one of those stages, basically? Um, well, as she mentioned, I had the relapse approximately, I think it was 10 months to one year and um, kind of disheartening because I thought we had it pretty much behind us. So um, yeah, uh, it was it wasn't nearly as severe, and it was much more short lived. Um, I recovered uh, quicker from it. It it wasn't as long lasting as the first, but um, kind of disappointing to see I fell into that percentage of the relapse group, you know. But so far, um, it's been uneventful since then. So hopefully, it's we're moving in the right direction. Dr. Sheen, do you have any? questions or any comments about um, Carrie's care or her relapses before we go into asking you all the questions we've gotten from patients, which are many. <laughs> My only comment about um, her course that the skin biopsy did not did not show vasculitis or confirm the IgA vasculitis. And I want to highlight the reason why, because, you know, when we when we recommend to obtain the biopsy, we need to obtain a biopsy from a fresh lesion that is like 24 to 40 hours old in order, in, in order to detect IgA deposits. OK, so that's why we had to do the kidney biopsy at the end and just in order to confirm her diagnosis. And it's very hard because, you know, like, oh, which lesion is like 24, which one is yeah. 
feet so it's a little bit hard but that's that's usually dermatology they will know exactly okay which one is new which one is old so they want biopsy the old lesion um um i think i think yeah her case is very typical of iga vasculitis well we're glad she got care with you so that you could uh, get it under control for her. So now we're gonna delve into, we've gotten many questions from IGA patients and we're gonna try and get as many as we can in. Um, the first one is, and this is interesting because we did a webinar on um, urticarial vasculitis not too long ago. So the patient asks, what if any are the differences between IGA and urticarial vasculitis? Are they both treated similarly? So um, urticarial vasculitis usually in general cause, um, causes hives or um, very itchy lesion. Comparing to IgA vasculitis will cause like bruises, like purpuric rash. Um, yes, we do use some medication in common to treat both conditions such as colchicine, dapsone, hydroxychloroquine. But sometimes in urticarial vasculitis, we have different categories of medication to treat that. So appearance is a little bit different, symptoms different, um, and treatment can be different as well. Though like there are some common medication we do use to treat both. Thank you for answering that. Um, this is an interesting one. You touched on a little bit the other name that this was known by the Hinoch Schoenlein purpura. And one of the patients asks, why, why was the disease changed from this name to IgA? It's interesting because this has happened to several versions of vasculitis. That's very true. Um, and the main reason why it was changed in 2012, just to, to reflect, you know, what we are seeing on the biopsy, the histopathology. Um, and this is, and that's why it was changed to IgA vasculitis in, in, instead of HSP or Hinocha line purpura. Well, there's always a good answer. <laughs> uh, do patients sometimes have IgA and another type of vasculitis? And if so, what is there a common other form that they get? There, I think there are there are um, few reports about association of IgA vasculitis and um, Pachette disease. This is um, another form of systemic vasculitis disease, and I've heard about some association with ANCA vasculitis and IgA vasculitis, but I haven't seen any case yet. Okay. Um, interesting because I think when I talked with Carrie earlier, she, this, this question might have some, she might have thoughts on this too. Other, uh, one patient says that they've read uh, things about IgA, other possible triggers for IgA vasculitis include certain medicines, food reactions, insect bites, vaccinations and rarely cancer, which you did touch on that a bit, but there seem to be so many varied things. And sh this patient is saying, I don't understand what is common among them. And I think you also touched a little bit on pathogenesis could be environmental, or there's some question about that. And that's what Carrie was maybe wants to talk about a little bit. I'm not sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned, the most common trigger in, in, in children is infection. Um, upper respiratory infection, gastrointestinal. However, in adults, um, medications, certain like specific antibiotic, um, anti-inflammatory medication, um, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, um, malignancy, other autoimmune disorders. Um, and um, this is maybe vaccination, few reports about vaccination may trigger IgA vasculitis. And I think few reports about insect bites, and I will let Carrie talk about that from her experience. <laughs> yes, we've had a lot of conversation about this. Um, there's really no, I don't think we have any evidence behind it because um, of what the chemical in question was. Um, I had uh, some bee issues at my home, both internally and externally, and um, because coincidentally about three to four weeks before I had my first initial reaction, um, I had bees internally in my ceiling and I had an exterminator come in and spray for them. Um, that was the only thing that um, we were trying to determine any change in any dietary medication infections or whatever, we went through the list. And so this was the only thing that, I, that was out of the ordinary that Dr. Yashin and I have discussed. And ironically, like the next, after the next 10 months, 
we had an issue outside. So I had the exterminator come and spray on the outside of the home. And it was shortly after that, that I had my little episode of the relapse. So whether they're connected or not, or just coincidental, we can't, there's so many um, ingredients in that. You can't get a, like a material data sheet to pinpoint anything. We'd never be able to pinpoint anything specific. So um, it's just ironic. We, we can't say for sure, um, you know, if there was anything in there, but it was just something that uh, presented itself and we we continue to discuss, so as a possibility. What did you think about that, Dr. Sheen? I think it, it is possible. It is reported. I don't think I can confirm that by any way, and I don't think I can rule out any way. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, another question that we got, he did touch on this a little bit about the difference between uh, it affecting children and adults, but somebody says, why does IGA typically affect children more than adults? This is a very good question, and um, I don't know the exact answer to it. Um, and I did try to search to see if there is any answer but I couldn't find anything. But my assumption may be because of high infection rate during childhood and like strep pharyngitis and like a lot of upper respiratory tract infection, maybe that's why it's more common in childhood comparing to adults. Understood. There a couple of the other questions you did completely address in your um, presentation. So I'm gonna skip one and move down to, I'm confused by the term IgAN. Is this another form of IgA vasculitis? I read it's another name for Berger's disease. And is this accurate? So IgA nephropathy is, is different disease from IgA vasculitis. It's mainly affects kidney and may present with um, um, protein urea, like abnormal protein in the urine. Um, it does not have skin manifestation, does not have gastrointestinal. So it's it's, it's not really a vasculitis disease. It's 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 just, it's mainly affecting the kidney. This one is, this next question was, is very um, normal and heard quite often. Is there any validity to some articles suggesting that patients who receive COVID vaccines later develop IgA vasculitis? And is it also true that the flu shot has been associated with developing IgA in rare instances? Um, there have been few reports about um, reporting IgA vasculitis, new diagnosis, or even reactivation of IgA vasculitis post-coronavirus vaccine. Um, I don't think we can confirm such association with certainty. I don't think we can rule it out 100%. Um, it is very possible. Um, but however, cases are very mild, did not require too much of immunosuppressive therapy. And I don't think that would be absolute contraindication to receive the vaccine. We have to remember that vaccination did save a lot of lives, right? So at the end of the day, it's case by case. It's a shared decision between the patient and the provider. And thanks for saying that again, because we do like to repeat that message, how important the vaccines actually are and how much evidence there is about how, how great they've been for us. Um, I did want to ask one patient sent in a question. Um, once the patient has had kidney failure caused by IgA vasculitis, if they get a kidney transplant, what are the chances IgA would recur in the transplanted kidney? I thought that was an interesting question. I think it may. Um, and if I remember correctly, maybe in up to 10% of cases. So even after kidney transplant, they still, they have to monitor the kidney function and the urine analysis. Okay. And now I have a couple of questions for you about research. And I'm hoping you're, one of them is, what are the missing gaps or areas of highest interest to researchers concerning IgA? And are there any recent or clinical studies looking at these areas of interest? Um, yes, I think we need, I think we have few gaps in understanding few aspects of, um, of IgA vasculitis, understanding the disease, the differences between adults and children, why it's different, why it's more common in children comparing to adults. And we have a few ongoing studies um, looking at rituximab. This is one immunosuppressant that we, we do use a lot in our vasculitis um, 
for our vasculitis patient to treat renal disease. So one study is looking at that, and then there is another one looking how do we treat skin um, manifestation, skin rash in IgA vasculitis, looking at different medication, including colchicine, dapsone, and um, azathioprine. Um, Carrie, do you have any final questions for Dr. Yashin? Um, I was just con um, concerned about it, what she thought about what causes the flare-ups, uh, um, uh, the relapses, again, what could cause that? Is it something, you know, could it be dietary or medicinal or just what you thought about that? Um. I don't know the answer for this question, but I think once you have one relapse, it means that you are at risk for having further relapse in the future. And um, we, we, I mean, you, in general, as I said, infection, medication, others could trigger the relapse, could trigger the disease in the beginning. So once you have, in your case, you had one relapse already. So this is will put you at higher risk for having another relapse in the future. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I can identify the trigger. Sometimes that, it's very hard. And yeah. that's a hard thing. I know. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to hear. And <laughs> I personally understand it. I, I had five relapses, but I've been eight years without a relapse now. So oh, that's awesome. I wish you well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm in good care. You are. And so I want to say thank you so much to both of you. We, we love doing these webinars, both for the patients and for the physicians, so that there is information easily accessible to all of them through the Vasculitis Foundation. So our special thanks to you, Carrie, and to you, Dr. Yashin, for sharing today so that other people can benefit from your experience. And um, of course, the Vasculitis Foundation, we appreciate all of the doctors and all the patients that are involved in the research.